It's my great pleasure to introduce our guest uh, today, Aida Ponce del Castillo. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, senior researcher at the European Trade Union Institute. Um, Aida has been uh, is a lawyer. She has done uh, work on uh, on uh, legal issues of new and emerging technologies, and lately on uh, specifically, more specifically, on artificial intelligence and uh, uh, workers' rights in the so-called platform economy. So. And uh, um, it's, it's really a great pleasure and a honor to have you here today at NEXA. Uh, the topic for today is algorithmic management, features, impacts, legal issues. What's the current state of play? Okay, as uh, usual, before, uh, before we start uh, the, uh, the seminar, we will do a brief round table to, um, to introduce ourselves. So my, I'm Maurizio Borghi and uh, I'm uh, from the law department and I'm co-director of, uh, of the NEXA Center. I'm Siderina Le Mecuda Parigi, University of Sergi Parigi, University of Paris, and I'm Faculty of Philosophy and Technique. Marco Ricolfi, uh, former professor of IP at the law school, co-director of uh, the center. I'm Ludovica Pazeri, a postdoc researcher at the University of Turin, a law department in the philosophy of law and legal politics. I'm working on open science policies of the data. Related to the scientific research field. I'm Fabiana Vinci, and I'm a student uh, of the last year here in Politecnico of the master degree in data science and engineering. Okay. I am Anita yeah. Bot, I'm the communication manager of the center. I'm Giovanni Garifo, I'm a software engineer and uh, the manager of the Nexa Center. I'm Beatrice Balsa. I was an intern for Texas Center and now I have a uh, research scholarship at the Department of Law with the Professor Balsa. I'm Coach Rostenati, I'm one of the co directors of the Texas Center and I'm a software engineer. Also, um, I'm Edward Bert, I'm a student of Global Law and uh, Transnational Legal Studies at the UNITO. Can you share your name again? Eduardo Greco. I'm Sara, I'm also a student of Global Law and Transnational Legal Studies, and we cover the course of Web and Commerce Law with Professor Bordi. Okay, thanks. Uh, Aida, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for this uh, very kind invitation. It's my pleasure to be here because I know that it's a very, very well recognized center across Europe and I have very good friends that have uh, not only recommended but also have uh, come here to speak. Some of them have, have really said incredible things about uh, your work and about the atmosphere and environment that is in the center. So I was, I was very curious to come here and, and feel it for myself. So thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to uh, speak about algorithmic management or what is called algorithmic management and I will do it in three parts. I will explain some of the features, not so technically speaking, but uh, as far as I can uh, see that of how algorithmic management is driven or it's working. Then I will speak about those impacts that we can see on workers or on the, or the working space and the working environment. And I will finally close by explaining a little bit of what's happening with the legal or regulatory issues or debates that is ha are happening now at the European level, concretely with one proposed directive on platform work. Don't hesitate to interrupt me. If you don't, uh, if I don't uh, send a message across, if there is any doubt, I don't like monologues. Of course, we can have a debate at the end and so on. 
Well, the point of departure is that companies and any workplaces at all levels are being constructed in a very complicated manner because of the data-driven um, business models that underpin their missions and values or their profits. And we can see clearly different layers of automated systems, whether it's a factory building cars or transport modes, because now they don't sell cars, they sell modes of transportation, whether it's another company selling uh, learning systems for teachers who should teach, but they should also be used to uh, engage with the technology in many other ways, except from get that go beyond just the interaction with the students. And these companies and organizations are really evolving thanks to the different layers that can be seen, hardware, kind of software as well, but also unseen push of the technology in many ways. We also have uh, seen the increased um, layers of computational in business analytics and decisions. So it's not only in organizing the business models and the companies or the structures, but models are taking more pr prominent roles in helping in decision making, or at least in feeding um, the analytics decision making of those who have to take the decision now, all the time. The CEOs have these apps scrolling constantly to see what data is coming in so that they can make the, the point for the negotiation with real people at the table in real time. Um, business engineering or business analytics is the new uh, strand in all these type of companies who are feeding the data all the time. So uh, automation in companies vary a lot. And we, also, we see also processes that collect not only financial, business-related data, but also data that comes from workers in the company. And this is what is interesting, me, interesting to me. It's not just any AI system in a company. It's those AI systems or those algorithms that really interact in a way with a human being, which happens to be a worker, not a customer, a worker. I will explain why. And uh, we can also see that this um, use or collection of data, it's blurring lines between what is supposed to do, uh, what does a machine supposed to do and what is left to the worker, human worker to do. And we can see uh, the example of the radiologist. It's very obvious because it's a very high demanding technical job. It's not just done. Yeah? It's a profession that is screaming technical in both ways. Uh, image recognition with the eye of the human and questioning the patient. What do you feel? Where can I take the photo? And now they are confronted with different ways of judging a photo and whether they are right in judging that photo with their eyes or a model is telling them it's not cancer. Um, or judging whether there might be perhaps an error in, in the tilting of the photo, which is not showing exactly where there is a problem or not. We have uh, professions, on the other hand, that perhaps are less technical, but they are <laughs> driven a lot by the fast demand and pace of the task that they need to to perform, uh, attend, taking patients all the time or just assisting some other uh, care workers, for example, um, by the minute, by the time, every 10 minutes they have to shift from work from patient to patient. So we see that uh, everywhere. Artificial intelligence or algorithmic management doesn't belong to one single sector, which is also very incredibly attractive for lawyers because um, in the past, we tend to analyze sectors by how the technology impact them. The same technology impacting a car, the car manufacturers do not impact the health sector system. Absolutely not. But now what we see is that they are driven by the same models, which is ex extremely, incredibly fascinating. So I have more or less uh, looked at, uh, started to look at different sectors, finance and banking sector, which is by definition, a sector driven by data and workers since 
a long time ago, are very used to, try to, to work with data and to be automated in their various tasks. We can see that now banks do not have uh, managers attending you. You have, you have your mobile banking app. So there is a clear shift on how uh, workers' agency in this time is being just shifted. But also uh, we can see that some algorithms or systems are recommending workers in the banking sector how to respond to clients' demands, where to drive the conversation, what type of tone of voice should be used and whether they are being using words that are not engaging with the client and so forth. With the rail, Belgian railway, this is absolutely fascinating because when, when maintenance workers have to repair a railway, they have to use this tacit knowledge in observing the railway where there, there are leaves of the trees going onto the tracks and blocking um, the, the train or there are just uh, some wooden um, railways that have been moved because of the heat, contraction and uh, um, not contraction. And they know it because they know these villages where the, where the train stops and they observe all the time, they're used to that. A few years ago and even before the pandemic now, this capacity of ma maintained railways have been uh, shifted to uh, predictive maintenance with monitoring, distance monitoring through drones and even virtual reality. And work maintenance workers are going, are trained to do to this type of analytical job. Uh, of course, you are more, more and more um, aware of uh, workers in warehouses in Europe and outside of Europe being driven by all sorts of machines. And and this is where I, I, it's the technical stuff. But what is algorithm management? So what, I, it's a construction term. Um, um, the idea of algorithm management, uh, management is as follows. We have an input, which comes through an algorithm or a machine learning model and a software. And that machine is also complemented by other digital technologies, whether it's a train or a computer or a robot itself or a, a device. So there is a complementarity between the container of the logic and the actionable machine. Then um, there is a large scale of fine grain data collection. And this is, again, where I insist where my interest lies. Not every machine does that. I'm just interested in those models that collect personal data. And this personal data comes from two sources. The main source being two main sources. One of them being the individual itself, uh, whether it is if, um, how many times and, and time, how many executions and times this person uh, spend to do a, cer a certain job or task, whether it's located, geolocalization data, physiological data, um, the tone of voice, in behavioral data it's, uh, in a way, and, and the time. There is also some sort of data that is not really personal, it's not really even sensitive. And it's, uh, well, sorry, and, and, and it's, it's that, no, I, I rephrase, it's not obvious that it's personal nor sensitive. And it's that data that we can analyze with a second eye. And this is this awareness of, of the context, whether the worker is able to react or not in a specific situation with specific external factors that well, he has to, to deal with at the moment, unpredictable situations or predictable situations, also, uh, how much time does a worker take to react or that responsiveness? Uh, how much time? <laughs> Answer the question. And there you go. Five minutes delay, not good. And the interactivity with the environment, the external environment. This is, this is behavioral data, which is absolutely fascinating because can it be standardized? And it's a question for the engineers. <laughs> can we predict a model in which we can standardize all, all of this stuff and then have sit back and say, okay, then anybody can do anything. 
Uh, what happens to this data? This data then is, has two purposes. Algorithmic management does one, monitoring that data or seeing that data. I don't like to use the word monitoring, but this is a word that is being used in legal texts. For me, it's just seeing the data. And the other one is assisting in decision making. Uh, these are the two main features that algorithms do in order for the company to make or to develop, to make a new model, to develop the existing model, to improve the algorithm so that it can again do the same thing again and again and again and again. That's my understanding of how algorithm management works. Um, and uh, well, but this is how it works on paper in a way, in a very simplified manner. And this is how it's applied to a working relationship. But what's a working relationship? The working relationship is a relationship between an employer and an employee, two human entities in a way, in which the employer has a capacity to provide, to say, well, here is your contract. Uh, would you like to work with me? You say yes. Yes, you agree. And sign. You do so certain tasks and I give you the money. Fair? Do you agree? You agree. Okay, so you come at six o'clock in the morning. You have to work from five to ten. You have only one break and so on. So you agree to the conditions that are given in a specific contract, just like you buy a car. Well, sorry, the labor lawyers will kill me if I say that, but, but you agree to a certain parameters <laughs> and that are also backed by the law. You can sign a specific labor contract in your country that is legal because it is enshrined in a legal framework. So you cannot just sign any contract because you have to, you have to work from five to 10. Yeah, but it's my contract. You say, yes, but if you go to the law, the, the law set, sets minimum standards in which these contractual clauses can be uh, done in a, in a very legal basis. So we have a contract in a law. And this is how the employer employment relationship normally is done. So the worker is in a subordination relationship with the employer. He has to abide to what is said in the contract in order to get the money. That's the employment relationship. But what happens with those technical systems that you know very well that now are kind of in between them. What happens with that employment relationship? Any idea? Well, there is a tension. It's like inserting uh, in a bouncy uh, system, something in between, a brick. And then the, the bouncing system doesn't really bounce anymore. It's like, okay, I'm bouncing, but at the same time, I'm being blocked because normally that relationship normally should be more fluid. So there is this tension that we don't know how to solve. And that's the problem of algorithm management. Uh, and that's, that mediation thing is that middle part that is really new. It's really in the core of the employment relationship. And what do we see? We have technology in all sorts and flavors, hardware, software, and whatever. We have converging technology. It's not just one robot and one car. We have mechanic arms, we have cobots, software, uh, and other layers in the organization that come into a specific department. Factories are not just single out uh, departments that do one job and that's it, but they are completely uh, converging. Everything depends out of everything. We cannot just cut a company in pieces and that's it. Uh, I think about a university, I think it's more or less the same. And then there are decisions that are being favored thanks to all this multiplicity of little data aggregated that someone makes, puts into an app and gives to the CEO. And somehow the decision is somewhere there. The humans validate. 
What happens on the side of the worker? On the multiple types of workers, middle management, technicians, even high level management, sometimes they, they don't understand. Well, they, some of them can understand that their data is useful. How many patients have you seen? How many cars have you built or tires? How many railways have you uh, observed this, fixed this month? Some workers have been discriminated because of reasons that we still do not know. Whether you receive a job because you're black, white, or purple, or men or women, or pregnant, or no, whatever reason, doesn't matter. People have started to realize that hmm, I'm shift, being shifted out of my of my of my work and they understand that these systems are not completely clear or transparent or fair because they don't understand how can someone understand how this mediation is being driven it's very difficult and there is a sort of what i call a concealment of the employment relationship uh, when a worker would have a problem doing, while doing a job, an injury, or a, ra a race pay, a complaint, there will be a human, and at least there will be, at the worst, a confrontation, a complaint. And these data-driven technologies are concealing who's responsible for what, who should do what, and what are my own responsibilities with my own duties. So, we're kind of lost. What do I do here? So that's that's the, the picture. Harms can be produced. Yes. Yes. Which ones? I'm not sure. Psychosocials. Yes. Which ones? I'm still not sure. That we haven't have enough data to say. Okay, this is caused because of the algorithm. Because the exposure and, and then the way we analyze harm. It's not like just analyzing uh, another type of risk assessment. It's, it's a bit tricky. Can you go back to concealment? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because harm, <coughs> harm, we perfectly well understand uh, how the, what we call causation uh, chain uh, may be obscured. But uh, concealment, in which way an algorithm helps concealing? Uh, which? In which way an algorithm on this management uh, algorithmic governance conceals? Uh, you um, explain it, but if you can elaborate sure. a little bit. Sure. I think it's the concealment of the worker agency. I, it's, will, it will be. It's, not the, it's not the algorithm conceals. Well, by definition, an algorithm in a black box, it's a kind of a system that we don't see. We don't see and we don't understand and sometimes it's blocked because it belongs to someone and you cannot open it. So for any reason, it's very difficult to read or access. But I refer to concealment to the, act, the agency of the worker. It's the person or the individual, it's, it's being concealed. It's like having a blurring line between the real person and the task that is or the, the actions that should be executed. Doesn't matter if you do it, just show me the data. This is what I call the concealment. It's not about a, the human being with the disabilities, capacities, human capacities anymore. The data is there. And then where is the worker? <laughs> the nurse, the this data engineer, whatever work, it doesn't matter, the pilot. Uh, in a normal, traditional employment relationship, there are certain rights that the workers have upon an employer. They can ask for a pay raise or they can even negotiate. I don't like this uh, clause that you put from that I should work from five to ten. Let's negotiate and then we bargain. But here, I'm not, I'm not sure if the worker is still has this autonomy. This is why the word autonomy is crossed out. I'm, I'm not sure. This is a contested terrain. Is it, does, it have a, does the worker have autonomy when dealing and working through a mediated, uh, data-mediated workplace or not? What is autonomy anyways? Uh, 
the capacity the capacity to to react or to act agency yes well more or less at what extent under what conditions um does it have the capacity to negotiate negotiate what what to negotiate i don't understand anything of what should what can i negotiate you are a worker is in a position of negotiating when there is evidence or signs of stuff happening but if I don't have the data. What can I negotiate as a worker? And capacity to gain knowledge? Well, probably, but still with no knowledge of what? And assess risks? How? <laughs> how can a worker that is operating a system, whether it's in a factory, on a radiology situation, even on a plane, can assess a risk when the machine is telling him or her different date and he doesn't know what to do. Um, human machine interaction here is, is in question. An interesting um, question for lawyers because perhaps this might require a different way of regulating, but this is not the question for today. So what are the impacts? The impacts of this mediated um, relationship, digital mediated relationship, I three in my view. The first one, which I have explained, it's the subordination relationship. We have, we have an employment contract under labor law versus the terms and conditions. <laughs> this is the terms and conditions are those uh, contracts that normally uh, labor geek workers or geek workers sign. They just have to click. It's not possible to say, well, can you please give me a bonus? No, no, you sign the terms of conditions or you don't have the job. So contract versus terms of conditions. Then we have the rules on, on the power relationship. There is power relationship between the manager and a worker. Yes, because the manager is paying money for a job to be done. But what type of power is it when the worker is engaging with the machine? Is it power anyways? For the philosopher over there. <laughs> I don't I, the philosopher either. Is it is that power? I don't know. It's just a question. And then this real-time data availability, because what the worker is providing all the time, whether it's working action or not working in action, it's data. Data all the time and improve or uh, uh, updated by the second. And then we have all these new features that we didn't have before in labor law. Pricing models. Pricing models. I think that they mean wages, perhaps. <laughs> or minimum salary, I don't know. But now it's pricing models. This is, this is Uber patented um, model. We have rewards and uh, disciplinary measures, and also deactivation. That sounds like dismissal, which is a concept of national labor law. And I, I just copied here a very interesting uh, tweet a couple of days ago, I think, from Uber, because they have, again, renewed their policies on pricing models. So these algorithms, or not algorithms, these companies set the, the, the terms of, of use and read on, on, on the very important aspect of labor law, wages, and they just have this liberty capacity to, oh, well, I change them again. And it's much better for you in ways that, that you don't, that workers don't understand when in, in terms which are not legal. They're not even in accordance to the labor national law. So it's very interesting how this just shifts all the time, all the time. How can we cope with that? I don't know. So the question, do workers work less with automation? It's supposed to be easier <laughs> automating tasks. It's supposed to release and, uh, and yeah, let's cool it. And now many people say, let's do AI because we're going to do the cool things and be creative, right? Okay, well, ask the waiter if, if she's working less because she's being monitored on how, how many times she has to speak with a client and how many orders she needs to make. Um, second um, 
impact besides the subordination relationship is work organization. So how companies organize, organize in what ways companies organize work in order to produce a product or provide a service. So again, there have a lot of technological sophistication that no, they don't necessarily disclose and explain. Hello, dear workers, I'm telling you that I have implanted this new machine that will do this, this and that and will link to this, this and those services. These things are not explained. Uh, allocation of tasks is uh, also done in a not clear manner because, well, it changes all the time. Parameters to allocate the tasks change and sometimes employees do not understand why. Uh, for example, we have new uh, concepts like group optimization, everything that needs to be optimized, like how people should drive or operate in a way, it's embedded into an essential part of how work is organized. Work is a, it's a social construction. It's, it's, a, it's an essential activity of the human being. I think that people have worked for years and years and the value of work is mainly, or has been mainly social. And there, on top of that, there are certain aspects that cannot be automated. It's impossible to automate human judgment, or I don't know if you have the, the answer for that, or what should I do? Should I crash the plane or follow what the automated pilot says or do another option C? Or should I um, operate the patient or not? Maybe the picture is tilted and this is why there is no, uh, um, uh, diagnosis of, of a ripe cancer that I think with my um, tacit knowledge that it is because of the symptoms of the patient and so on. So work of organization is being shifted. If it's difficult to organize work, because we are all humans are difficult to organize and this is our human nature, with this layer that conceals certain agencies, it's even more difficult. This is what platform work is experiencing now. And most of service services uh, industry services catering, uh, hotel um, um, call centers, those are the ones who are providing services. Care workers, of course. What happens to the individual worker? In my view, it's not taking a prominent role because it's just a data point or a source of data. It has uh, a lot of information. Um, to, to provide as a person, as a human being, sensitive data, non-sensitive data, but also uh, information about their own status and activities in the company, plus aggregated information of the external sources of data to which that worker is interacting with, and hence creating more data, which is valuable for, for a company. Although, although lots of data is being created by the nanosecond we don't know how it's measured and we don't know how much of that data is used on the issue of metrics are we applying the good metric to measure whatever we're measuring what is the good metric and secondly who can tell me in a company what data is valuable and what data is just trash those things about metric everything that is collectible could be measurable. I don't know for what. Uh, there are some researchers that are uh, digging into this interesting question. Uh, work intensification, because the pace of work, or no, the pace of doing tasks is being more agile than workers, of course, feel that in their own being, and people now are burnout everywhere. Well, sorry, but it's not just one cause just to make you, you the exaggeration, people get tired, basically. Uh, frustration, many workers, specifically this is more, more on the gig working, are, are frustrated because of the interaction with the mobile apps. We see uh, within service of drivers that they try to more or less say, okay, how can I get more customers? 
and try to play or work with the algorithm, but they get frustrated because the, the return is not what they expect and overwhelmed by the different layers of automation uh, on, with unpredictable reactions. These have, have been the, the experiences of pilots um, piloting very well all these specifically Boeing aircraft who say, but we are constantly being automated and our training, which is very precise and consistent, doesn't cope with the level of automation that we have to bear and we don't know what to do. And we're constantly uh, um, confronted with unpredictable decisions. Agency, do they have agency? Uh, again, uh, this is a question that they, they also question about themselves. I don't know whether I'm a worker or not because who is my boss? This is the, the whole thing. Uh, do I have a boss or is it really an algorithm taking a decision? All right, so now the legal issues. <laughs> Let's go to, to Europe. Let's move to Europe because this is happening at the moment at the European Union, a game between the European Commission, which is the master player uh, drafting laws and the European Parliament. And then uh, the member states saying yes, no, yes, no. And um, negotiation between Italy and uh, Poland and France and Germany and all these things that you can imagine, which is very interesting. So like two years ago, the European Commission just released the first legal instrument to regulate AI or to regulate how AI systems are placed in the market, which is different. We are not regulating the technology itself. We're just regulating the way how products or services should be uh, sell, uh, put in the market. And then with this um, AI Act, there is uh, the Annex 3.4, which refers to employment. It's the only reference to the world of work. And this is where they refer to algorithm management, in my view. They say that systems that are used for recruitment and advertising vacancies, screening, filtering applications are normally uh, of a high risk. This is more or less what you see in platform world. You recognize that. Do you think that this is the only um, definition or description of algorithms interfering in the world of work? Just a quick stomach reaction. That process, but that produces high risk? What? I mean, whoa. No. no, no, it's not the only way in which algorithms relate with the worker. Uh, and the second one is uh, in, uh, AI systems that are intended to, to be used to make decisions and promotion and termination of work and con contractual relationships for task, task allocation. Those two paragraphs, to me, they summarize what I understand and many other legal scholars understand by algorithm management, management through AI. But there are many other descriptions that do not fall into these two paragraphs that also use AI and are also used to mediate workers. Why aren't they here? Or why did the commission only prefer to choose this as a high risk? Does it mean that other uses of AI in the work environment are not of a high risk? Okay, well, it may be risk assessment. Huh? Explain why then? But the commission didn't explain. Okay, so we are at the moment negotiating this AI Act, and probably it will be um, uh, signed in a few months. In parallel, and a year later, the Commission provided another um, draft directive in the social aspect or for labor law. So, okay, I have to tell you that this AI Act, it's an AI Act that is meant to be, um, it's, a, it's a regulation. It means that it applies everywhere at the same level and no member state can make a change. And it's a market, it's, it's something that will Im 
improve the single market, how Europe buys and sells AI products and increases its competitiveness. It's a competitiveness uh, um, regulation. That's the aim, to make AI a sector in the EU. And the AI Act is crafted in such a way that providers, importers, uh, can find a nice track in order to put their services on the market without too much regulatory burden. Now, this directive is very different. It's not a directive that belongs to the single market. It's a directive that belongs to social protection. A labor law is very, is, is always very old as well, and we have a lots of directives, but as you have seen, the subordination relationship has been changing and has been notched by AI systems. And it was time to update this, some of the legal obligations and the commission proposed a directive that can be a little bit modified by member states, depending on national law, on the working conditions of platform work. It defines it's strictly for platform work. It means that their provisions do not apply to other workers managed by algorithms outside in aircrafts or in transport sector or in care centers and hospitals in, in universities. No, it's only for gig workers for those riding or driving or I think doing click work as well. Something that uh, Antonio Casilli is looking at very, very profoundly. And they define automated monitoring and decision-making systems in the chapter of algorithmic management. And again, it looks like very, very similar to what the Commission proposed in the AI Act. Very similar. So this is the official definition so far of algorithmic management. This directive has been highly debated and negotiated within the Parliament. Uh, and highly debated because at the same time, the Uber files came out, which was, I don't know if you follow the news about this, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I, I'm always reading that for so me it's a given, but I don't know if you are aware of the Uber files that the Guardian just published and revealed because a whistleblower revealed everything, all the practices, how Uber really nudges um, workers and the business model. So <laughs> when the, <laughs> When the Commission put out this directive two months later, more or less, the Uber files came out, so it was even more relevant. And we could see how the lobbies of platform work could really uh, interfere in how this law has been drafted. But, ah, an Italian MEP, Walmini, Elisabetta Walmini, she was in charge of the file at the Parliament, and uh, she had a more, um, she, her party being the social and democrats, she, her tendency was to have a directive that would really improve the working conditions of people and not just a directive that would improve the profits of uh, algorithm management. The, this directive was voted like last week, <laughs> finally, so it, this meeting is very interesting because the platform work directive has been improved a little bit by the, by the parliament and most of the proposals of algorithm management passed. So we have a directive on the side of the parliament that now has to be negotiated with member states. But so the directive has been adopted? By the, no, has been approved by the parliament. And has to go to the... Uh representatives of the member states. Exactly. That text now will together with the member states and they will, at the very high level of each country, they will negotiate again. <laughs> but what the changes that she made or that the whole negotiation made are also interesting because they are a little bit more precise, technically speaking. It's, they referred to First, automated monitoring systems or decision-making systems. They refer to the functioning. So how the algorithm works. That's very interesting. How it works. So Uber has to disclose that. Do you think that they're going to do it? 
No, but the law says so. Or the liver or Globo, Globo is famous. They have to. They also have to disclose the mode of operation of the features that affect the employment relationship. What's that? Like also other type of parameters, right? So it's interesting because then we can see, are they going to do that? Do you think you are pessimistic? No, you don't think they're going to do that. Do you? No? Depends, on the, depends on the sanctions for not doing it. Well, very interesting question, depending on the sanctions, yes. And on the, and the issue of data and more personal issues, so they have to disclose all the categories of data that these this, um, systems take into account and any performance evaluation mechanisms and any performance, um, any automated decision making system. So it's a little bit more clear of what's the obligation for the platforms to do vis-a-vis -vis the authority and vis-a-vis -vis the worker. Yes. Uh, if I understand correctly, we are in, in the first draft, there was just an obligation to inform the, the, the worker now there is an obligation to disclose the algorithm. Can we say this? More or less. I'll break it down. I'll skip this. Three act articles, you bear with me. I'll, be, I'll try to be super pedagogic. There is an obligation to inform. So yes, the platforms have to tell the worker. When, if they plan to use automated systems, if they are using them, and how they are using them. So, it's nice. It's pretty big. It's pretty big, do you think? If they plan to use it, plan. Yes, it's very big. If they're using them and how they use them to monitor, supervise, or evaluate. What's to monitor? What does monitoring mean? Does it mean observing? For me, Monitoring means observing, just seeing the data, making decisions with that data. It's a different thing. Monitoring, it's an active verb that entails doing something with that. Anyways, that's very philosophical. Then uh, they also have to say about the automated decision making. They have to say when a decision making system affect the working conditions. What does that mean? What does affect the working conditions? Negatively, positively, significantly, at what step? Who is going to measure that affectation of the working conditions? What working conditions? And uh, the categories of the decisions, the parameters and the grounds of that, of how that decision was made. How can they do, how can digital platforms can do that? How? How can they disclose the specific parameter under which a decision was taken at that moment on that specific worker. When we know that Uber algorithm uh, updates itself or it's updated uh, super regularly. And when new patterns are inputted here in order to improve the, make the algorithm more robust all the time, all the time. So I don't know who's going to do that. And I don't know what means the either supervisory authority or the lawyers of the worker platform work or any technical engineer can extract that. There's also an obligation, Mauricio, to inform uh, the worker in a detailed manner. So you want to know, here you have, have fun with it. What do you do when you have this? What, what do you do? Uh, legal dis points of discussion of this, of this article. It's great to inform, it's fantastic, it's absolutely amazing, but then, we know that uh, the, 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 the scale of collection of data, it's really fine tuned and it's really what data is observed and by whom, what data is used to make the decisions, how to assess that the decision is really affecting someone significantly, me and you are differently. So the effects on you and me are also differently. So the severity of the decision needs to be assessed with, I don't know what type of risk assessment model that the directive doesn't disclose. Article number six, then article number 
the digital platforms cannot process data that is not intrinsically necessary for the performance of a contract. Right. They, they, live, they, live on, they live of that, no? no? Mm. They live because of the platform business model is dependent on this fine-grained data, isn't it? Why not just necessary? It's intrinsically necessary for the performance of the contract. I don't know what that data is, and I don't know whether this is a realistic provision because we know that platforms make a business model thanks to that fine grade data. And they have a provision to collect personal, emotional, or psychosocial data, health data, private conversations with workers' representatives, and collect data while the platform worker is not working which has been the famous case here in Italy with this global uh, plat uh, case in the court. I don't know which court. Uh, in, Turin. in Turin. Oh. Yes. In Turin. Oh. Okay, this oh, was the quid. Bologna. Mm. Bologna. This was the quid. The platform was collecting data of the worker while he was sleeping at home. And this is not interestingly related to your contract. So interesting. Um, the GDPR goes a little bit further. The GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, for, uh, prohibits to collect also data related to training membership, membership to political opinion and some profiling practices. Um, if this is an article derived from, if this directive or chapter, it's, an, it's a chapter derived more or less from Article 22 of GDPR, more or less, why doesn't it say that profi certain profiling practices should be banned? Why? I don't know. Uh, article number seven, it's about monitoring and evaluating the impact of the decisions that impact working conditions, only working conditions. We're not talking about other decision makings. Those are the decision, the decisions of the the decisions that are important for this directive are only those that impact working conditions. <laughs> Which ones? How are we going to know that? Um, particularly regarding to occupational health and safety and so on and so forth. And um, well, it's it's very difficult to to understand that from from my point of view. If platforms operate through an app which is highly mediated by algorithms, and there are very less humans in a way operating behind the platform, so and the and the law, the new law will say that there must be humans monitoring that these decisions are being taken. The, through humanly mediated models or resources, excuse me. So does that mean that Uber will hire thousands of humans to monitor their automated decision-making systems? Isn't that contrary to the platform business model? How many humans do they have to hire to monitor all these decision-making systems? Or how can risks be assessed by humans? Uh, and how many humans, uh, yes, et cetera. Human, uh, then what happens uh, after a decision-making system is done on a worker and that worker is impacted and happens to say, I don't like the decision. If he says or she says, I think it's impacting me in a negative way. Well, the worker has this uh, two chances. They have the right to explanation that we all know, copy paste from GDPR, more or less. You don't like it? Okay, I'll tell you a little bit. You don't like it even more? Well, it has to be more or less described in a nice way, but you have the right to appeal. So you have the right to review. And this review has to be uh, substantially. It's a substantial reply. And the platform has the obligation to either rectify the automated decision 
or to compensate. If he cannot, if the platform cannot rectify because it's impossible, it should compensate. I don't know how to compensate, but, but that the, the law doesn't go that far. We have seen also because we, there are many, there are hundred cases in Europe against Uber and platform work and all these uh, platforms, hundred cases, legal cases in national courts. And some of these cases, in some of these cases, the judges have said, well, show me that you have put a human in this decision, Uber. And Uber said, yes, this is it. Here are my humans. It's very easy for the platforms to demonstrate that there has been a human involved in a decision-making system. What is being debated now in court is <clears throat> the meaningful intervention of that human in that decision-making system whether it's really being revised by a competent human and how. So <clears throat> those human reviews, will they be really done meaningfully or just like they have been done so far as we have seen in the court cases? I will finish. I think that having a law on AI in the workplace it's very valuable because it's a way to modernize labor law. It's super. I think that having a law on AI systems for the single market is also great because it also gives us the lawyers a, a way to, to, to just, just to, in, in, to be <clears throat> more <clears throat> interested in other ways of governing technologies because besides the law, we have sandboxes and standards and all, all sorts of things that come along the AI act that uh, deserves another uh, Nexa talk. But I don't think that having um, these legal frameworks are enough because as you can, can see, there are many limits that we cannot resolve just by negotiating between France and Italy and uh, uh, Poland and Portugal. I mean, by the member states with very high political level and uh, they have political interest in negotiating a, a directive. They are not working with platforms. So at the end, any law that will be passed will be product of a high level negotiation. And this is how policy making works. And it's fine with that. So adjusting the legal framework so far could be an, a, a possibility. So now that the member states will have the directive on their hands, there is a chance that this vague provisions could be a little bit more uh, clarified. There is a chance. There is also a chance that they will be as vague as possible for many other reasons. I think that there is other ways. There could be ways to enable the human in the loop in technical ways or enabling feedback of workers or humans on how the systems work so that they are really adjustable for human conditions and not just for data, data, data and decision making or monitoring. I also think that there are other uh, uh, techniques such as reverse engineering. And I know uh, a person who has been worked uh, here in Nexa, Claudio Agosti, who is suggesting that and proving that his method on uh, algorithmic analysis can help to look at what data is being fed by the algorithm and see what is being really impacted in the working conditions. These are, of course, other means that could be used to better understand. But I also think that negotiating as we used to negotiate in traditional companies, employers and employees, what is an agreement, what should be in an agreement or not, is also useful. An example of that is an agreement that has been signed uh, with in Spain with a platform, I think it's the Deliveroo platform in, in Spain there. And it has been quite interesting. A law from that has been derived. Uh, emerging technologies do pose uh, legal questions, but also pose uh, technical questions. And there is no one way to fix the, the uncertainties that we have at the moment. And with that, I really thank you for, for your time and uh, for your attention. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are now open the floor um, to the discussion. I noted the various points and I have many questions to, to ask. I just need to, to choose 
uh, which ones, but I, I will first uh, um, open the floor to the, to the attendants and also to the people online. So I would like to ask you a question about you. Uh, you mentioned at some point uh, the, the the importance of metrics and. Uh, um, the way in which uh, algorithms and all this data collected is uh, then uh, used to, uh, to, to for, for, uh, for decision making. And uh, I thought that uh, in, in, uh, in other areas, uh, uh, matrix are, uh, there are certain attempts to, to, to define matrix in a sort of a collective way. So getting involved uh, all actors um, in, uh, in question. So I, I, I would uh, I would like to know if uh, you have any knowledge of any uh, good practice, like uh, for example, ma matrix that are that have been defined in collaboration with I don't know trade unions or workers' organizations, so that uh, uh, the the matrix used in in a working environment are sort of the the outcome of a shared uh, approach. That, that, that involves uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and, uh, and workers. And, or is, is, this is something that is not in sight at the moment? I don't think that it's a topic that is very popular within the um, working environment. I am not aware of negotiating metrics with, for example, doctors or, or pilots or who are uh, those professions that are really um, perhaps more uh, working together with the systems and are interacting with them in a more data analytical way than mm -hmm. platform workers. Platform just receive them. There are, I don't like to use the term, but they are more passive users in a way. It's very difficult to, I don't, I am not aware. And it would be great if so, if they could be involved because uh, they know, they know it's their stuff. I'm not aware. Probably this could be a topic for a technical standard, like, mm -hmm. like any document, technical documentation. As you might know, the AI Act will be operationalized through standardization. So the legal obligations in the AI Act, they say data collection, data minimization, but exactly how that will be done will be delineated by technical standards that are in the, in the way to be adopted and crafted now. That the issue of metric is not a legal obligation. And I don't know at what extent uh, they could include it. I, I'm not, I don't know, but that's a question that it's uh, interesting that to, in theory to ask. Should, should be a typical, one of the typical elements of negotiations, no? in the negotiations between uh, uh, corporations and, uh, and trade unions who negotiate a number of of, uh, of things. Uh, yes, like why, why yes. not negotiating also the the ways in which uh, workers' performance is uh, is measured, is assessed, uh, and uh, um, so wh why not making matrix a uh, subject of uh, mm -hmm. of an open negotiations between. Uh, uh, the, the close, capitalists and, and workers. The closest example of metrics that I know that trade unions are able to negotiate are those metrics related to chemical exposure. What levels mm. should we be able to work in this particular environment? Plus, and these metrics are, this, this type of negotiations have been there since people work with hazardous substances. So it happens and it's normal in a bargaining situation. Should this be translated and how this be translated to a data-driven um, conversation, that would be super interesting. I don't know it, but I will investigate if there is something happening. <laughs> Please. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much because it was very interesting. It's not my field of research, so I have a lot of questions, but the first one uh, is related to the, the proposed directive on, on working conditions in the platform uh, 
in the platform sector. Uh, reading uh, Article 6 uh, and also uh, Article 6, uh, Paragraph 2 and 5, uh, it seems to me that it's quite the, the debate or the kind of issues related to these uh, new uh, articles, new directive, uh, it seems to me uh, that are quite related to uh, the, the, the debate of the right to explanation of Article 22 of the yes. GDPR. Yes. So again, which kind of human intervention you said you said that you said something about uh, which kind of disclosure. I mean, the disclosure of the functioning of the algorithm, the disclosure of the, the way of uh, operation uh, of the algorithm, or the data on the basis. So I was just wondering if this is not, a, to some extent, uh, quite related to these articles of the, the debate of Article 22. Uh, so maybe I, I don't know. It's just an idea. So we should try to see another perspective, to find another way to deal with the... Uh, so, uh, starting from this idea, I was wondering if you checked on the uh, reaction of judges or uh, the point of view of judicial sector, mm -hmm. uh, because also <coughs> if you mentioned uh, this case uh, of the Deliveroo versus the Union uh, in Italy. It was quite related to the, to the disclosure of information related to the algorithm. So, Great question, and thank you for the feedback. So, uh, I'm a great fan of GDPR, um, with all its defects and whatever, doesn't matter. I really like it, and I believe in GDPR, like in a believing, you know, like hopeful, in a hopeful. I know for a fact that GDPR is not going to be open, not going to be open for negotiations uh, with the with the policymakers. That's set in stone. So that's why I will keep on GDPR. We know if you are more or less uh, aware of how GDPR works, uh, more or less. Yes. You know that it has great uh, articles and, and rights, and there is this very fantastic right to explain me the reason why this, uh, this decision has been done, the logic behind Article 22. Uh, lots of discussion on Article 22. I know uh, we all understand uh, that it's a little bit wonky, if you like, it doesn't work, basically. Uh, lots of legal discussions saying how to improve Article 22. And at the same time, the policymaker says we are not going to open it, so leave it, leave it, leave it with that. Data protection authorities are trying to more or less make uh, judgments about Article 22. Some of the national data protection authorities are more willing to give the be uh, be more beneficial to the claimant, other data subject, others to no, you don't deserve an explanation. Period. It depends. <clears throat> now, since we know that GDPR is not going to be opened, I think that the deal was to copy paste the provisions of GDPR: right to information, right to access right to rectification, right to explanation, right to revision, and that's it. Copy-paste the main GDPR rights into the Platform Work Directive, but without any fundamental improvement. And this is why we fall again into the wonkiness of Article 22, not solving the real issue of give me an explanation. What explanation is that? And what do I do with it? Because, okay, fine, give me a great explanation, which is the, what the privacy, maybe technical scholars like to see. From a worker protection perspective, what do I do with it? What do I do with an explanation? What do I do with an explanation? I don't know what to do with an explanation. Yes, I go to the platform, I said rectify. Okay, rectify. And then what? Fire or compensate? But it doesn't improve the mechanics of, of, of the decision making. It doesn't improve in a positive way, if you, if you like. Um, so, to cut short my answer, the Platform Work Directive improved a tiny little bit the right to explanation, but it didn't solve the fundamental uh, deficiencies of Article 22 of GDPR. I have spoken with, uh, not with judges, I have spoken with data protection authorities because they are very pissed off. <laughs> because they say, 
these articles, if you read the platform war directive, uh, it says that the provisions related to data protection will be observed by data protection authorities, right? Because they are their field. The provisions on the platform work directive that describe data access will be observed and monitored by the competent authority. The provisions of on, on occupational health and safety, working conditions will be observed by labor authorities. This is the beauty of the platform work directive. Two competent authorities are obliged to observe different provisions of the platform work directive. Further, they say, okay, you have to observe this, but you have to talk to each other in order, because when a case comes, we cannot just divide it in two. You have to assess the data protection issue and you the labor issue. You have to communicate. So I ring my friends in the labor inspectorate. Manuel, his name is Manuel. Manuel, how much do you know about AI? I, I don't know anything about AI. I'm, I'm busy trying to just monitor normal working conditions in factories and so on. Okay, do you know about algorithm management? Okay, do you know about this platform? Yes. So how do you think that you, labor inspector, going to monitor all these things related to the platform where they're at? I, I, we don't know. Overloaded capacity, limited resources. Okay, fair enough. In Italy, in Spain, everywhere, the labor inspector is, is full. I call the data, super, uh, data protection authorities. Hey guys, what do you think about this one? Well, Sorry, but we don't have any clue and we are not competent to assess issues of working conditions. We first, we are over, we are one in Malta, one data protection, uh, data protection authority in Malta, three in Belgium, I don't know how many in France. The way in which this, this uh, provision of Article 22 will be implemented and observed or followed by data issues, privacy issues, and working condition issues, it's going to be, I want to see it. I want to see how authorities will do. We don't know. Also considering the fact that it's a directive, so we need to take into account the, the I mean, a second layers, the national layers. It will be the task of, uh, of trade unions to develop the capacity and the technical capacity to monitor these uh, aspects of the platform economy. Yes, I think so. <clears throat> Trade unions have what they call safety representatives. The safety representatives are those people in the company or in a factory or in a school to observe if workers are working safely. If their windows are open, not contaminated, how many levels, all these things that they can observe and try to negotiate or assess the risks says because they see it. Uh, not all companies have trade unions and not all companies allow trade unions to be part of risk assessment together with the employer. Health and safety uh, laws mainly in everywhere in Europe say that this risk assessment should be done with the employer and employee and technical people and they negotiate together. Uh, it could be, I have uh, told them already, that they have to increase that another role in this capacity to assess safety, also to assess in a part privacy issues. And that they have to build their capacity also to look at those privacy issues related to the working, working environment. They have to learn, yes, well, they have to learn like you and me. We are all learning in the process. They have, they don't have the capacity, but they are very interested and a way through go into this type of negotiating data is through the DPOs of the companies that they know how data is really being collected and that they can also be an interlocutor with unions who are not necessarily specialized on technical or on privacy issues. So a tripartite uh, new relationship could be formed there in, in specific workplaces. And uh, this is a great chance they have. Trade unions in general have been losing power and influence in the last decades. This is a great chance they have to regain some ground. And also left-wing parties, uh, which are looking for a mission. We don't know, they, they know that they're 
left, but they don't know what uh, this means now. This is also a chance for them to work with trade unions in uh, giving uh, more power uh, on the floor to workers. This is a great chance, in my opinion. Yes, for me too, even in GDPR, there is this article that says that um, associations <laughs> that would like to represent collective uh, interests of people who have uh, knowledge on privacy, they could represent um, the claimants of the data subjects upon the, the data protection authorities. And I think that trade unions today might not be privacy experts, but they have this chance to become privacy experts at the workplace. They have to, in any case, and at both sides of the story, whether it's data protection, fundamental rights, or working conditions, there is a, a margin of maneuver for them to in the United States, a lot is happening. I think that um, there are new unions which are being created uh, at Amazon uh, and other places where you would not expect to have them, but uh, they are... Yes, absolutely. Tech workers, this is how yeah. they are called uh, in Amazon and Google. Um, and it's very interesting phenomena because it's not just... When we, when we say worker, we think about low skilled worker or the bottom in the line but something that has emerged into tech workers and this is what they say the tech coalition workers an organization in the uss work a tech worker is anybody whether it's designing deploying or providing the data anybody involved in doing the ai this is a tech worker and uh and they are making a coalition for very different purposes and aims and it's very interesting how they are they're building them their the power to for many 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 things many whether it's discrimination this famous uh researcher in google who resigned or who was fired um and uh other people uh in the sector are 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 claiming for it. it's it's an interesting phenomenon some of them are unionized some of them are not but in any case the collective movement is always very interesting Hey, thank you for your presentation. Since I'm not a lawyer, um, I will try to make some comments, uh, more general comments, so less technical. Uh, it's a very good opportunity to do so. Um, you started saying that the relationship between employer and the worker is, um, is a special relationship and is a relationship based on tension, I think is the word that you used. Um, we could say this is a relationship which is fundamentally unbalanced. So there is a strong side, which is the employer, and a, and a weak side, which is the worker, which applies, I think, in 99% of the cases. And, and so there is a power unbalance. Now, when there is power unbalance, I think we could formulate a, a sort of a general law saying that if there is a power unbalance, the collection of data will make the balance even worse. Because typically the collection of power is made by the, the side which has already more power and it will use the, the collection of, of data to make it uh, worse. Now, in this scenario, uh, I, uh, we could try to think more radically and think why should worker allow the collection of any data regarding them? Uh, what is the, the, the positive side? I cannot think of a single positive consequence of collecting data on a worker, for the worker. I can see some potential benefits for the employer, but not for the worker. So I wonder whether, the, taking you know, the extreme to the radical stance, uh, whether the workers uh, uh, should not fight for prohibiting any sorts of automatic automatic collection of data and, uh, and just to say, okay, you want to collect data on me, you have to do it by hand, like you always did in the past, you know, since, since the beginning of the industrial revolution. So I wonder whether the stance of being, you know, uh, using privacy law and, and it's always defensive, like, it's like a, assuming that it's okay to collect data on the work and then you fight on you know, the defenses and maybe you should try to circumscribe that, maybe we should be careful about that. What about the more um, radical position, like saying, no, you're not going to collect any data whatsoever? 
Yeah. I think that this should be the closing remark of the talk. I thank you for that. I love it. Uh, I like uh, I like radical statements too, just because um, they are fantastic. So yes, I agree with you. Uh, in principle, GDPR says that because of this imbalance of power, the consent of the worker is not a legal basis. It's not a valid legal basis to collect data. So. Would you like, can you give me your data? That doesn't work and it's not valid. In principle, it's banned. People, companies do it all the time, yes, and workers are unaware that consent is not valid. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's a fantastic proposal. One of the criticisms that I have to Article 22 and to the profiling, um, copy paste, uh, the profiling prohibition in data in privacy law is that why in this new directive or even in the AI Act, because the AI Act says shouldn't, there are some prohibited practices, why didn't the legislature, legislature um, think about prohibiting data collection in the context of employment? When I told you, uh, what can they, what else can you think about that? Well, I wanted to hear some uses shouldn't be allowed at all. At all. Why did the legislation just open the box and just limit it to algorithm management? And all the rest is no risk, basically. May I add another problem? Yes. <laughs> Why shouldn't the trade unions or other collective organization collect data on the employers? <laughs> Why should it be unidirectional? Why shouldn't it collect data on the managers? Right, I suppose that that's a great uh, suggestion. How, technically speaking, with what money, basically? Right, exactly. So, for should... what purpose? So, economic... But for the same, no? for monitoring. <laughs> Um, I think that um, the question, the answer is technical feasibility, but we have seen with uh, Claudio's, um, Claudia Agosti's model of uh, reverse engineering that can be done. We can, reverse engineering techniques can observe data and at the same time collect data from, from employers or how they they, they see well, about us. Think about using like, something like Microsoft Teams, uh, which is used by all layers, uh, including management. Of course, only management can access, can have access of the data of the lower level employees. But in principle, the data is there. So in principle, even lower level employees could access the data regarding the managers on a platform like Microsoft Teams, right? So it's just hierarchy, it's just, Structures of power that prevent that, but it's not technically possible. Thank you. I would add that, that uh, we had a, a trade union uh, a struggle cycle in the late 60s. The outcome of this was a review of legislation in uh, many countries, the UK, uh, Germany, and Italy. Italy was one of the most radical, and the Statuto dei Laboratori was passed in. 1970. The then minister was uh, Dona Carlo Donat Catena. And it has a number of prohibitions about collecting data uh, through surveillance mechanism. Video cameras were prohibited. I, I'm not a labor lawyer, but uh, they are still there, I think. Uh, and so I don't know if. Uh, Certainly, labor lawyers are conversant with this, but there is not the so called Jobs Act in Italy has weakened those provisions, as far as I remember. That's true. Uh, but uh, in principle, the starting point 50, 60, 53 years ago was no collection of certain data, hand collection, fine. Even there is what is called use variant, the, the employer has a right to change the conditions of work because uh, he's the boss. So he, so he decides what is done and how it is done. But the data, no, 
if they are automated, they're collected in an automated uh, way. This was 53 years ago. And so I think that this is very reasonable. Um, Mark, I'll stop here. Position C. Um, I, I've got a question which is probably in line with that from Laura that she asked a couple of minutes before getting disconnected. But this, what is central in your talk and in a lot of very stimulating talk about the impact of machines and automate, automate in the working place is that of transparency, which has been up arcing in the last, I would say, 20, 30 years probably. But of course, transparency is a uh, detail, is in, devil is in the details probably, that you could uh, disclose as much information as you want if you're not able to understand what's behind this huge legs. So that, uh, I was wondering, um, and I'm not a lawyer, so this is really a question for someone who is inside the um, low building process. If I understand, well, um, we're switching from a paradigm where we're just releasing information to a paradigm where we're asking explanation. That is, um, it's a real step uh, forward, it's a quantum leap. Because if, if you're asking somebody to explain, you're asking that, that structural institution company to disclose some of the secret recipes inside business, for example, which is really much more than just releasing data, that you can do anything with this. And all the more with AI, where the question of explainability is at the core of the algorithm. Of course, if you, if you take a deep learning algorithm and, and you look at it, you've got like lines of Python, you cannot do anything with this. But this is another question, but with transparency, there is also a twofold issue. If I open, <laughs> the black box we were talking about, and I look at the Python lines of codes 20 years ago, I'm not sure I could really understand what's what behind also. So the question is, it reminds me of uh, a similar problem in France that, that happened a couple years ago with the uh, selection algorithm for the uh, entrance at university was called Parcoursup. Maybe some of you heard about this. We have in France this kind of very, uh, black box approach to selection of the university that they kind of re, uh, refurbish, renovate many times, but without changing anything, still a black box. So they decided to open the code. Now who is able to get into that? So that the, the, the background question is that of complexity. How do you cope with complexity from a uh, mere citizen point of view? So that the question of explanation sounds very interesting to me to kind of impart some power, some democratic power inside the relation to technology. If this is what happened, this is a very good thing. Uh, once again, because um, transparency is, is, a, is a very beautiful concept, but you need to have competence behind to understand, but you need to have time also. This is 24 hours a day. So when, when you finish your work, you still have to get into the software, understand how it's happening, and make the cooking, and then, and then you own a hobby. It takes time, a lot of time. So basically, the responsibility, if I understand well nowadays, is on the side of the citizen to make the job, to understand what's happening, and to decipher all the uh, inside of the black box. So indeed, asking to explain is moving the responsibility to the side of the employer, which is a really good thing. Maybe I'm wrong with this, but I, it's what I'm more or less understood, which could understand the question of Laura as a side uh, byproduct. Oh, this is fascinating. Thank you. The European Commission a year ago uh, also proposed other laws for platforms and um, because they were just they are just over over our heads and, and, and backs and the logic was here was this one the bigger you are the more complex you are the more people you have the wealthier you are the more responsibilities you have 
Digital Services Act. Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act. I'm not going to, <coughs> maybe not all of you know that. So, it try to manage the competition issue, but also the responsibility issue. So if you are really, really using a lot of technology and complexity, and of course have a lot of money, you have more responsibility to disclose. And we want to see these algorithms ourselves. So that was a great model, logic. Okay, again, negotiated, many issues, fine. But still, I think it was a great way to, to deal with that transparency obligation to disclose or obliging them. The, this is not the logic that the platform world directive follow. Why didn't we import this logic of Uber is not a small platform? Uber is a gatekeeper in terms of the Digital Markets Act, right? So with that big responsibility that they have to be in the market of Europe, why didn't they, the Commission apply, okay, more obligations to disclose transparency? And of course the fines, because the fines in the Digital Markets Act and the digital, um, it's they are huge, they are absolutely huge. So they didn't. Uh, it's a nice way for the, for the, the again, copy paste GDPR, which are based, right, uh, rights based, uh, approach, given the responsibility of the, of the, on, on the employer to release something. But I think that the responsibility is on the data user to say, mm, wake up and be notch. And I don't think this is fair. What is fair in the network? And this is, this is a quantum leap. I don't know if, if data subjects, will always all will react to that. Some Uber workers now are doing that and it's great, but the platform business model is everywhere in the hospitals. How can nurses do that? Will they have the, the, the gods just to say, I don't like the, your model, give it to me. <laughs> Explain to me how you schedule my shifts. I'm a pregnant woman. Why do you give me night shifts? All these things, I'm exaggerating a bit, but um, I don't think that the responsibility, well, that the responsibility is on the employer. I think the responsibility is on the data subject to exercise those rights at the best of their possibilities. Um, is that realistic? Let's see. Nice points, I really like them. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. And because uh, once at a conference about uh, uh, the role of algorithms uh, in the job market, uh, a colleague of mine of uh, Dutch University who studied it said that, uh, well, she doesn't like uh, the use of the many algorithms to decide whether someone has to work or not, to keep a job or not, etc. But she wouldn't like to be judged by an algorithm when making uh, uh, the application to the university <laughs> and when the university had to decide whether to give her a job or not. No? And I was surprised because uh, in Italy we have uh, many problems with uh, having a job at the university because uh, you believe that the decision is not very objective, it's, it is very subjective, no? <laughs> uh, because the commission the decides has a huge power. No? And then you would like to be judged by a machine or by a tool that is objective. No? And, and this colleague might told me that the same problem can be found in, in Holland, in many other places of the world. So I believe that when you have to do with an algorithm that has uh, to decide whether to give you a job or not, uh, and when you say that uh, the human should be in the loop, uh, you are talking about the need of balancing uh, a subjective part of the discourse and an objective one, no? because uh, Sometimes uh, having an algorithm that makes a matrix of how you work could be also 
good no, for the worker because it could defend the worker uh, against uh, uh, an, employer, an employer that wants to fire him no? or not. No, uh, objectively, the algorithm says that I do my job uh, well. No? And so, in my, in my opinion, uh, in my opinion uh, the problem is the one that uh, Shoshana Zuboff uh, underlined in her book on surveillance capitalism, the one we need, because uh, if they surveil on you and they are the only ones who know how the surveillance system works, they have a, an unbalanced power that uh, is unfair. But, uh, uh, if the mirror is two way, no? in the sense that you also can see uh, the matrix, uh, the data, etc., and you see exactly the same <laughs> uh, that uh, the, the, employ the employer sees, uh, then you can use uh, such data to defend yourself uh, and also to, to discuss no? with the human being, no? because the human being as a subjectivity in deciding uh, whether he likes uh, an employer or not, uh, if he wants to fire him or not. There is also an objective part in the discourse. And maybe uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence can be used uh, to insert no, an objective uh, part of the discourse in, in this relationship, which I agree must, must stay human, no? but humans also rely on, uh, on data and on uh, objective facts uh, to, to take decisions. Workers have been, we all have been the subject to performance evaluations, whether it's a questionnaire or an algorithm. Um, performance evaluations are uh, um, another format of people analytics. Uh, there have been many issues with this type of objectivizing your performance and again it's a question of metrics and what is being measured and how, with what metrics and for what reason. Uh, in an ideal world, an objective performance evaluation could be great. Uh, what we have seen in performance evaluations for, at least for those who drive in a car, is that suddenly their performance is not up to up, up, of great and they are deactivated. Mm, I think that we need a different conversation on how to objectivize performance and what that means in yeah, a mediated uh, uh, world. Absolutely, because yeah. I know that the matrix uh, are subjective, not in a sense. Yes. And if you have the power to decide the, mat the matrix, uh, you have a huge power. And of course, uh, they must be decided together, etc. etc. But uh, I want to say that. Uh, in my opinion, uh, in a discussion between human beings, uh, data can also be used uh, as a sort of a rhetoric uh, position and strategy to win, uh, not to win, to, uh, to because uh, if the, the rules of the game are clear, <laughs> uh, we all know the rules of the game we are playing, then I can also defend my position if you are deciding to, to fire me. No, for example, if your decision is unfair. If I may comment on what you're saying, may I? Um, I think you're being a little bit idealistic. Uh, in principle, you're right. But don't forget what uh, Aida said about bias. Uh, this data are used also to take biased decisions, like uh, the salary which is uh, received by an Afghan driver is not the same which is received from a Piedmontese driver. So there is no chance whatsoever that uh, the one-way mirror will become a two-way mirror because all the system would collapse in, 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 start, in a moment. Uh, so I think that uh, ideally you are right. Uh, but the assumption on which the system is based uh, is that these data are so biased that they are not knowable. What uh, Agosti is doing is exceedingly important because we'll never get this data other than by reverse engineering, I think. Yeah, reverse engineering is exactly the activity of the 
creating another two in here. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, so th this I was saying, it's not a matter of agreeing on the matrix, uh, because in any event, you'll never get this data by consensus. What you can do is to organize, to have collective action, and collective action will have also the professional task of organizing reverse engineering. And then you get there. <laughs> but if I have to think about how life was uh, before uh, using algorithms uh, in the job market, no? your boss came to you and said, I want to fire you because you don't work uh, properly. No? He said, why? Uh, I, I have always done uh, what I had to do. And uh, because the relationship is human, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the boss could have said, uh, oh, well, uh, I, I don't like the way you work, etc. And maybe, and maybe in a situation like this, uh, the worker could have been helped by a machine <laughs> to demonstrate that uh, it was just a subjective opinion no? of, of, the, of the employer. I, I believe. This is why I don't think uh, uh, the idea of one car. That, provocative idea of one car of uh, avoiding uh, uh, collective data at all, no? because uh, it, maybe if it's, uh, it is not fair, works, no? because maybe it's better to collect data, but it's better to collect data that uh, we agree on. No? Yeah, but the reality is that uh, this, uh, this matrix and this, the, this data collected are typically reinforcing abuse of powers. If there is an abuse of power in the absence of data, uh, inputting data in a system, uh, in, in this system, would, would, cannot increase the abuse of power. It's not going to, uh, to, to, to remedy. So I, I, I see the ideal situation in which uh, there is a completely neutral and a totally uh, um, agreed upon way of, of, uh, of collecting data, but the act of collecting data as such is, is, is an act of power, so, and uh, it is already biased uh, an image. So you believe that uh, it's impossible to huh? balance uh, this power inside a market, inside it's, a home? It's, like it's impossible to balance by means of uh, um, by look by looking focusing only on the on data and data collection, so it, it, of course it can be it, it, it can be remedied the, the, the abuse of power, but uh, data collection is a means. It's not a, it's a, it, it cannot be a means of remedying abuse of power. So you you are, you remedy abuse of power and then data collection can become. Uh, possibly more uh, sustainable and, uh, and so on. So that's that's my idea. Yeah, I totally agree. There, there should be a law no, that forces companies to agree on uh, the collection of data on the kind of data that must be. Let me let me tell you something. By definition, as, as um, Juan Carlos said, the relationship between the employer and the employee is asymmetric. By definition, that's starting point. The task of labor law is to more or less bring that imbalance of power to an equilibrium by providing rights, collective rights, etc. etc. So now we are facing a, an era in which that balance or asymmetry is even higher and the laws that we have right now are not able to bring that balance to an even situation because of many issues. So we are experiencing a kind of transformation and digital transformation of labor law, of legal theory, what's a worker, what's an employer, what's a, a, a working relationship. And on the other hand, we're also experiencing uh, an evolution of data has a value and even monetary value. And now we share data and give you your data and I give you a lot of money. So I think that um, there should be in my way, in my opinion, a limit to these uh, big gatekeepers who have 
the technical, the knowledge, and all the capacity to gather data in, discriminatory, in an indiscriminatory way. Because we, there is no contrabalance in, the, in, the, in law, at least uh, now, and, and in any other agreement that we have, to make that possible. That's, I don't think it's very fair. There's a question? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's more uh, concept that I would like to talk about. But, uh, I really agree about the, the, the last quote that you, that you say. Um, well, I think that another question that we can put on the, on the table is uh, about uh, um, the profit extraction, extraction from the from data the production. So if uh, uh, on one, from one point of view, the obviously the discriminative use of data uh, should not be uh, should not be here. So my company must not must not, must not uh, uh, be able to process data in such a way that could bring to some discrimination to workers. But uh, what about the value generated by uh, data that a company can exploit? So, uh, for example, if uh, um, Previously, we mentioned the um, Uber case, uh, or I think the uh, Uber Eats case, uh, we can, I think it's uh, pretty similar. Uh, the real product of these platforms or of these services, uh, it's not the code, uh, but probably it's the, uh, the, data, the data itself. So how uh, the, the value for Uber is uh, uh, all the knowledge that uh, they extracted from data from the workers and this uh, uh, they create profit from this data and this uh, uh, they are not remunerated so the, the uh, in the salary of the workers uh, it's not included the fact that they produce data and that, that uh, the, these data lead to a profit for to, to the company uh, so maybe this could Open yes. another great question. Uh, probably also, I think, put another <laughs> topic in the table uh, in terms of universal based uh, income. I think or, or uh, yeah, but it's absolutely amazing because this this question has been already discussed and it's been discussed. Uh, if they are making so much money with my data, why don't give, they give me a share of it? Some euros? Why not? It will make a huge difference in my living. Uh, Data ownership, they call it. Um, so, I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the data should become a commodity. Because if I sell you my watch, or I buy you your watch, I can do whatever I want with it, the watch that I have now, because it's mine. It's not longer yours. You can, can give it for free, or I can sell it for less. When data enters into proprietary law, then we can sell it, resell it, use it, destroy it, we can do whatever we want. Is that what we want to do with data? This is why the uh, one of another, um, there's another law or common, of law, common law uh, called the Data Act by the European Commission that originally introduced this concept of Uh, I don't remember because they change it many times. Data altruism. Data altruism. That anybody can give your data, the day your data to the company for the common good. Of course, everybody was like, "How can you do this?" Uh, I, for me, as a lawyer, I make the, the same metaphor, analogy of data cannot just be a transaction, cannot be a proprietary law, just like yours, or organs cannot be put into the market. Or the mm. heart, uh, the blood, I don't know, uh, it's except in very specific situations, plus, you can donate. Plus data is, is not individual, it's relational, and it has to do uh, in connection with all the similar data of other people. I think that uh, Muldoon has been uh, uh, studying uh, this, uh, uh, Professor Muldoon in uh, Exeter, I think. So how do we attach a, put a value, a monetary value on the data? But Antonio Gazzilli is working on this, actually. Mm -hmm. Antonio is saying uh, uh, 
uh, that uh, labor are producing data which have the value which Mr. Bandina is, uh, is saying, uh, and they don't get paid. Uh, probably it's it's not ownership uh, which is not changing hands. I mean, it's a claim uh, for compensation rather than a transfer of absolute mm -hmm. rights. Uh, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that just mm -hmm. reminds me, sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. No, no. Because this, a similar debate has occurred on, on uh, how to say it in English, uh, sur surrogate mothers. It's what? like what? Surrogate what? mothers. Surrogate mothers. Like, uh, ah, yes, surrogate because mothers. Because I've got yeah. this uh, word in French, uh, which is also the question of the boundary of data belonging somehow to your body. Because it is interpersonal videos of part of your life. And also, of course, this is more philosophical stance that what is the statute of data as a, um, in terms of is it uh, something uh, that has a value or a dignity to, to, to coin the, the terms? It's a Kantian approach. As if the body could have a statute of a merchandise of a me, a good. Or something which is no value, which is above any other value, which is somehow a dignity question of it cannot be paid for. So we see here that there is a strongly uh, cultural debate also. If, if if we see, for example, what happened in France with the problem of uh, legalization of uh, GPR, so in modern, it's been more or less between uh, Sylvian Agakinsky and and um, uh, Badinter, more or less the same kind of debate, where is, what, what is the boundary? Um, can you sell everything or can you sell part of it? So that the idea of compensation is quite interesting, but it kind of settles the temporally, of course, could be the debate here, without completely cutting off the, the decision, of course. So we have got to decide for the statute of data somehow, which is, philosophically entrenched. That is, we need to have debate democratically over what is the data? What's the value of data? Yeah. yeah, probably. I mean, uh, the, the point was not that much about the transfer of value from, yeah. but I mean, when you have a company whose market value depends highly, heavily on data collected from, from your employees, so uh, there should be somehow a duty to uh, to compensate the employees for for this, so that that's I think another. Yeah, just to make a clarification, the point was not on uh, personal data and how possibly to sell personal data, mm -hmm. but for example, the fact that a rider uses uh, Uber Eats uh, application to uh, deliver some goods, uh, uh, maybe uh, the algorithm of Uber Eats uh, learned that the best uh, way to get from point uh, A to point B is uh, a particular street that uh, maybe have less semaphores, mm -hmm. I don't know. This creates a value for the company. And it's not personal data, it's uh, the, the, the fact that the labor is uh, tracked. And uh, this work uh, that creates profit from the co for the company is not uh, on the stage. And this value created by the work, uh, by the way. Mm -hmm. In words of Uber, it is compensated because sometimes they have more jobs. And that's the way they understand compensation, <laughs> by giving you more work. That's liberalism. It's just, but I, I take the point, compensation, how can, can the work done by workers, not the data given by workers, but the work, or what Antonio Casilli is doing, data, <coughs> uh, people who are labeling data, well, mm. how can it be better compensated? Uh, okay, I, I take the point. I will think about it to be honest. So, Antonio is working on this because he's. Yes, yes. Antonio is working on this. I think that we have to, to uh, actually divide the two uh, issues. One is uh, some goods which are not sellable or are not sellable at the same conditions as other goods. Kidneys, surrogate uh, motherhood. Uh, personal data, and there is a whole school of thought. Uh, I think that Bruno Frey in Zurich was the one who inaugurated this kind of thought. Uh, 
on the American side, Hansman has written very good stuff to advocate more market and uh, less dignity, I would say. Yeah. But, but he's a good person, anyhow. So this is one debate. But we are not talking about really selling these goods. We are talking about we are not talking about property rules, but liability rules. We are not talking about transfers of absolute rights on these uh, on these uh, things. Eh? But we are talking about uh, a claim to compensation, and the claim to compensation in some way has to be rethought because uh, uh, it does make a lot of sense for businesses for information capitalism to keep uh, paying the old way and uh, uh, start profiting the new, new and postmodern mm -hmm. way, because uh, if they can keep doing this, they have a very nice margin. No? And they will do it. Yeah, and I think <laughs> our collective action is what Antonio and others are doing to understand uh, what is uh, being uh, um, appropriated. And I was asking you about conceding in a, in a way which is conceived uh, uh, from our side, and this is a, a big task before us, uh, mm. which is another asymmetry point. An asymmetry, yes. Mm. And one point which I keep saying, and you have heard me saying about collective, collective, and collective so many times, there is no way we can do this individually. We have civil society has been split in many subsectors, immigrants, uh, identity politics, uh, uh, parties and trade unions have been splintered. We have to recompose the, the, uh, the social body and then go about uh, creating countervailing powers uh, to information capitalism step by step, not individually, but by collective action, creating alliances and coalitions first. And this is what we should do, I think, yeah. Sinekem de Bu. Sinekem de Bu. Okay, well, so in the best tradition of the next uh, Wednesdays, we are finishing writing time. And uh, thank you again, Aida, for your fantastic presentation and mm -hmm. your lively engagement in, uh, in this interesting discussion. Pleasure is mine. So, thank you for your for the food for thoughts. Thank you very much, really. Thank you.